So I'd like to welcome Jessica Hepburn to the Childless Self. And I'm just oh, thank you for having me, Muriel. Very, it's a great pleasure. And I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourself. Yeah, well, I'm Jessica Hepburn. Um, I say on my website that I'm um, an author, arts producer, and adventure activist. Um, I like alliteration. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm still... It was so much easier to say what I was because, you know, several years ago, because for years I ran a theatre and it was just, when you met new people, you'd go, well, what do you do? I run a theatre. Um, it was really straightforward. Um, it now feels more complicated, but all my work sort of certainly um, over the last few years across these three areas have been around fertility, infertility, IVF. Um, and the reason being that um, uh, I, my partner and I were diagnosed with unexplained infertility um, feels like quite a long time ago now. Yeah. Um, and it was the um, what became like a decade long struggle to conceive that involved a total of 11 rounds yeah. of IVF. Um, and I guess that's why I'm here in yeah. your childless circle, because... Yeah. Um, it didn't work. I'm, yeah. I'm, I, I haven't got children. I mean, maybe we'll talk about this, Mary. I've got a complex um, relationship with the world, word childless. I, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, I am childless, yeah. but it isn't the, um, the first sort of um, word that I would define myself at, at, as. And also I'm sort of always constantly in dialogue with, because I think there's definitely some forms of parenthood motherhood that have a very finite time biological motherhood and I accept you know I'm 48 nearly 49 that biological motherhood is like probably impossible yes um, but it doesn't mean that there aren't necessarily other ways to sort of parent in the world so yeah um yeah I absolutely agree but I don't that. have children no I absolutely agree about there being other forms and other ways of parenting and in fact I wrote a blog a um, few months ago about being a childless mother. Yes. I think it was quite a challenging thing to say, to say I, I identify as somebody who is a childless mother. Yeah. So that, a lot of it is, is because a lot of the mothering I do is mothering as a verb. Yes. Rather than mothering as a noun. And I feel that yeah. I, I do a lot of mothering, even though I am not a mother. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, in fact, someone posted something beautiful on Instagram um over the weekend uh some uh, um someone that i know through the fertility world who's been yes. th on a um through um you know multiple rounds of ivf herself yeah. uh and was very active within the childless community actually ran more to life um oh, yeah. the fertility network uk's um uh, sort of the arm of the uh, arm of their charity that um, supports childless people, and uh, she but she has now become a mother through IVF. It was it was eventually successful, yeah. and she um, basically posted. Apparently, there's this sort of trend for T-shirts with sort of mother on them, with yeah. then a sort of the dictionary definition, yeah. and underneath it, and she. Um, she'd done an event for me over the weekend at the, the fertility show at the Olympia, at Olympia and she said you know like Jessica is this I mean it's really beautiful you know mm -hmm. Jessica is this description um, so yes I totally agree with yeah. you about the verb not a noun yeah and it's um it's a it's a comforting way of being it will never replace being a mother in the traditional no. sense but it no. is comforting to think that I still use um, some of those mothering elements in my life, including um, being a mother to myself, because actually yeah. mothering is a very broad term. Mm. And I had to learn how to be a supportive mother to myself because mm. I was pretty awful to myself for quite a long time. Mm. And it was actually very difficult to turn that around mm. and be uh, a supportive and loving and warm and nurturing person to myself. Yeah, yes, I, I actually think probably most humans have that problem. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We, yeah. I think the when you fail at happen. when you fail at something very significant, like yeah, you know, becoming totally. a mother, you can be quite harsh to yourself. Yeah. Totally. I wonder what it was that um, made you want to turn from your IVF 
that didn't work into working in the field of fertility and infertility and mm. running events like Fertility Fest, which had a fantastic mm. More to Life Day, which I, which I got a huge amount out of and found enlivening, supportive, and many other things. Yeah, I wonder what it was that made you kind of turn in that direction. Well, I mean, it's been an, a process of evolution. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the, I suppose the, the turn, turning part, I mean, I often say, like, when I give public talks, and this is totally true, mm. you know, I'm an incredibly private person, and I was really, really secretive about um, going through IVF for many, many years. I didn't tell my closest family, friends, work colleagues. Um, mm. And I suppose the first turning point where I was, was, was starting to write about it, yeah. which I, I did um, sort of shortly after I turned 40. I always think the decades, of de like I, I'm a big person for thinking, and, and I've got a big new decade coming up and yeah. I'm thinking about what that's gonna bring, but yeah. Um, I started writing about it and then I mean I think there's been a transformation and I hope I played a small part in that but I think it's a lot it's it's been a movement a lot of people yeah. over the last few years of um, a dialogue around um, fertility infertility childlessness yeah. um, uh, IVF um, the science of making babies and um, but when I first started writing, I mean, I, there weren't any books. There weren't uh, many sort of books. There wasn't. There was a lot. There was a lot sort of online. There were there were definitely online communities, yeah. but things like Twitter and Instagram didn't exist at that time. Yeah. Um, so the book coming out was the first thing really um, that sort of catapulted me. I always say, sort of in a way, now I've crossed over from. I mean, I, I very much consider myself as a patient advocate, but I, I have sort of crossed over to the other side. So, so first of all was the first book. And then I always joke that like, I, I thought in the beginning, the only people that sort of made art around this subject was me and Frida Kahlo. You know, I'd written my book and Frida had done all this amazing yeah. work around her infertility and miscarriage. Of course, it's total rubbish. Um, but I, because one of the things that happened when I'd written the book is that people started contacting me. I think because I ran a theater, I mentioned this yeah. earlier, yeah. you know, um, and people started to contact me about the work that they were making, whether it was writing or theater or um, other performing arts or visual art or, um, and I started to see it as well. And, and that was where the idea for like, well, what if we had a festival about? Yeah. And I've always really liked the festival aesthetic. You know, I worked for um, Brighton Festival earlier on in my career. Um, so I sort of really like the idea of bringing all this art together and having these conversations. And what's happened, you know, and it's, it's we've just this year run the third festival is it's really grown over those, those few years mm. as we've realized sort of as we've responded to the work that's being made and realized it's such a multifaceted subject and then and then the adventure activism yeah you know has been this other element which you know started with I have this big mantra which I've, I've written about in both my books um which is that it's all about that it was all about the number 43 because a friend of mine said to me that I went to university with she said Jessica if we haven't had a baby by the time we're 43, we can get on with the rest of our life. And of course, 43 is quite a significant age, so certainly in terms of um, biological motherhood. Um, you know, like the, the, I mean, the stats go down, your, your ability to conceive yeah. post 40 is very low, but like post 43 into your mid forties, you know, yeah. virtually impossible to conceive naturally with or without IVF. Yeah. And so I always thought, well, I will be pregnant by the time I'm 43. You know, I'd started yeah. when I was 34, but then my God, we went through our 11th round of IVF just before my 43rd birthday. And I, I just thought at that time, like, I've got to do something else. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like, I always say like, I've lo I'd lost this decade of my life to Project yeah. Baby. And I just, and that was when I thought, right, what am I going to do? And I, I drew up my bucket, I went to my bucket list and it was a childhood dream, dream to sort of swim the English Channel, but um, 
like I wasn't a very good swimmer. I mean, I could swim, but like I had no idea what was involved, but I started on this journey and, you know, it was terrifying to begin with, but it then ended up with me swimming the channel. And one of the things that I didn't read and writing a book about it. And one of the things that I really didn't realize is how many parallels there were going to be with going through IVF because you know, um, and now, you know, I'm climbing mountains, we might talk about it, but the sea and mountains are, you know, whether you can cross a channel or climb a mountain is basically dependent on whether nature allows you to do it. And it's the same with conceiving and carrying a baby. And also they're huge mental and physical endurance challenges and as is going through IVF. So they've become these challenges that I've taken on as well as being like you know extraordinary gifts in my Mm. life that I wouldn't have done Mm. if the IVF had been successful or we got pregnant naturally they've been really amazing for sort of campaigning to you know improve the things that I want to see improved Mm. in the world of fertility which I hope that I've done across the books and the festival and then Mm. the challenges yeah absolutely and I think you, you touched on your latest challenge being a mountaineering challenge. Yeah. And I don't know if, 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 if you can talk about that yet or if that's got to wait for... Well, a... I mean, I, I sort of, it, it's sort of seeping out into the world. I yeah. haven't, uh, you know, I haven't issued a press, a press release or anything like that. But people, you know, when I get interviewed and, you know, I yeah. I'd tell people and... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm training. To, I've been in training for the last few years to climb Everest next year. Um, exactly the same with um, swimming the channel. I, like, I knew nothing about mountaineering. I didn't even know what a crampon or a crevasse was a few years ago. Wow. Um, and uh, but if I do it, and you know, I mean, I, you know, I got a go in five months' time, so um, it is happening. Um, and if I do it, um, I will become the first woman to have ever achieved what is called the Pond to Peak Challenge, which is to swim the channel and climb Everest. Um, and yeah, that's really, um, you know, exciting, you know, an exciting thing. Yeah. It feels, so it's a sort of climax yeah. of this decade yeah. of work, really. And then your, you know, your, the, your fifties will begin. Yeah. Will the adventure activism, um, continue, do you think into your fifties or will it? Well, of course everyone wants continue? to know. So I've done the channel and then I, ran the marathon for fertility yeah. network uk and now it's my mountain or what i call my mountain madness but and everyone always sort of wants to know well what next and yeah. i mean the main thing is that um i i i sort of want um it's really difficult once you have mm. sort of got to the climax of a challenge yeah. because it then there's a sort of anti you know there's a natural yeah. anti-climax of you know it's just, same with anything, you know, um, yeah. a natural anticlimax afterwards. Um, but I, and I'm, I've been through that before, so I know, I know that will be coming, but also there's a sort of vacuum, a, a vacuum that I'm, yeah. I'm trying to keep open so yeah. that I can rest, which I don't okay. feel like I've really done very much no. um, at of over the last few years. And then yeah. think about, well, what is the next decade? Yeah. And I think, you know, in the same way that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm quite interested in having different careers in life. It's sort of, um, you know, I, I never want to do the same thing. I want to do yeah. different things. So I, you know, I, uh, when I was a child, I, uh, my dream was to run a theatre. I mean, I ended up doing that quite young and I uh, ran the Lyric in West London for 10 years. And then, yeah. and then that's sort of gone into this career of, um, around fertility but I've taken the sort of arts with me in terms of the yeah. festival and I'm absolutely sure that um, you know the, the world of fertility will 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 continue and the way in the way that the arts have continued yeah. but I just like I think I just feel a new thing emerging but I don't know what that is yeah, yeah. it's got to emerge in its own time yeah yeah and I do also say you know like when people because I always get a little bit sensitive when people said, oh, you know, the questions you get because you get interviewed, um, you know, like, when did you, you know, when did you decide to um, give up becoming a mother? And I'm always like, I'm always a little bit, um, 
sort of defensive about that question because you know there is a possibility that my 50s could be about fostering for example yeah, yeah. you know like or, or adoption I mean yeah. you know I'm not saying that any of these things are easy but no. um or but I just I, I I'm still in dialogue with that maybe, yeah. maybe it will be a different yeah it will be a different period of my life I don't know it's as if the different strands are interwoven it's yes like yes that bit's finished and the adventure activism started it's these different strands are carrying on, or maybe that yeah, yeah. it's part of this creative spirit. Yes, and yeah, yeah. It's carrying on and, and, and anything could be created or any. Yes, yeah, yeah. Any, any, the adventure could go in many different directions. Yeah, that's, yeah. yes, that's the. Yeah, it's interesting about, about language. You were saying earlier how you, in some ways, find the term childless to be quite a difficult term. And I agree mm. that it's difficult in the sense that it's got a, it's got a less in it. It's got something mm. missing in it. And I wonder if there's a, a word or a, a phrase that you prefer to use to describe yourself. I mean, I've, you know, obviously, obviously, fundamentally, we're all people. And that's yeah, yeah, an important yeah. word that we can use to describe ourselves. But I wonder if there is a, a phrase or a word that feels more comfortable. Do you know, I, I can't say that there is. No. Um, I, I definitely... I mean, I, I, it's really funny, you know, like, I, I think um, sometimes, you know, like, yeah, God, it's a terrible solipsistic thing to do. You look at, you Google yourself, you know, and you can, and it comes up and it says what the most good, you know, when people are Googling me, yeah. like what, what they're looking for. And one of the things that they often look for is, did Jessica have a, did Jessica Hepburn have a child? Yeah. And it, um, and in the, and obviously I have stayed at the heart of the fertility industry that, yeah. you know, which I always think is a bit odd because, you know, I'm the black sheep of that industry, but I have become, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, someone that sort of is work, is working with them, you know, and, and I have fertility clinics supporting fertility vests mm -hmm. and supporting my climb and, um, mm -hmm. You know, um, and and one of the things that I like is this fluidity about well, you know, people not entirely knowing. Yeah. Because I don't, I just don't want to be boxed. Yeah. I, I, but I'm really, I mean, I'm delighted to be part of your childless circle Thank and you. be invited because I actually think sometimes the childless community sometimes a bit anxious about asking me to do childless sort yeah. of things because they don't quite know how I categorize myself yeah. but I you know I am childless I don't yeah. I don't have yeah. certainly at the moment I don't have children yeah but um but I I'm sort of also want to sort of I think the thing is that I I mean the truth is and I and it's not right but mm -hmm. I I think that there's still stigma and we're needing to break it down about yeah. like, oh, well, you, you know, like you didn't, you didn't get the baby. You, you can't pass go, yeah. go over into that group of people. And, and with everything that I'm, and, and we'll stay here and everything that I'm trying to do. And I don't know, I don't know where that's coming from because actually some of the people that I've had the most support and love from mm -hmm. and have become the, my best friends are people who are mothers. Yeah. And I think, I, I, I just don't, I really want to fight to, for an environment where it's not you're the people without children and you're the people with children. And I think by maintaining this sort of slightly fluid position, I have done that for myself. And I hope that for, for others, that shows a possibility to be in this sort of slightly fluid place. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that everyone wants to be there. You know, some people will want to be stridently childless or child free, yeah. you know, um, and that's totally fine. Yeah. But I, you know, I, it's, it's the same thing, Mariel, for me. And that the other question I always get asked is, well, have you got over it? Have you come to terms with the fact that you're never going to be a mother? And my answer to that is like, I'm never getting over this. You yeah. know, like I'm carrying with it, this with me for the rest of my life. It yeah. doesn't mean that I can't have an amazing life. Yeah. But, it, but I, and those two things can coexist. Yeah. So I suppose I'm sort of really interested in a, in, in a world where I'm a mother and I'm not a mother. 
Yeah. You know, I'm childless and I'm not childless. Yeah. And I'll decide what I am. But I, I, I you know, that, I suppose that's where I am. Sorry, that's a very long-winded no, answer. brilliant. I think more and more we're living in a world where we acknowledge that people are not just one thing or the other. Yeah. I think it's really important to acknowledge that there is a spectrum, that there is a non-binary fluidity. Um, yeah. And we move from state to state within that. And I think another thing that's really important to acknowledge, sorry, that's my doorbell, which I'm just going to <laughs> ignore. Um, another thing that's really important to acknowledge um, is to listen, to be part of a group. You know, I, I will always be a childless woman, but I really want to listen to people who have children. What's that like? Um, yeah. I don't want to be completely, you know, set, one of the things I want to do next year is set up groups where women with and without children can listen to each other and talk about what it's like, because I think there's a real need for, for disparate groups in our society, whatever they are, to really Absolutely. listen. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, um, just because we didn't get the thing that we wanted, yeah. it doesn't mean that the other side is all roses. You know, mm -hmm. like, actually, my friends who have children are, are struggling and I, I, in many different ways, you know. And, you know, and I, I always say that if I had children, I'd, you know, I'd probably have been the person who was campaigning for better maternity rights and, you know, um, uh, and, you know, the, how hard it is to, you know, continue working and, uh, uh, you know, and bring up your family like that. So it's, re you know, it is really hard not getting the thing that you dreamed of and that assumed yeah. that you would have. Um, really really hard but um but it doesn't mean that the other side is easy at all it isn't no and i think that's what will come out from listening and sharing experiences is that hopefully a greater understanding of what it's like to be the other person yeah absolutely and all. so yeah that's what i'd like to do for well child this week next year brilliant um, is begin you know to begin to get that started I think um, many people would probably describe you as a role model um, and somebody, you know, who's paving the way and who's in, in, literally in terms of climbing mountains and swimming the channel and running marathons, um, which are yeah, horrendously difficult things to do. I would imagine having never, I did climb a mountain, but I've never thought about doing any which of Which mountain did you climb? Well, I've climbed a few in my time because um, my father was a very keen climber so every holiday as children we would either go to Wales or Scotland and um slight Can you climb Snowdonia yes yeah and ben Nevis? yes most most of the um Welsh and Scottish mountains Brilliant. I've climbed and um last year we my brother and some friends and I and my nephew um climbed a mountain in Scotland and we um this is completely unrelated to our conversation but it's quite a lovely story it was very difficult it was a horrendously difficult mountain to climb, and um, the names temporarily escaped me. Mm. But we took my dad's ashes to the top. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> and although that wasn't anywhere near like um, climbing Everest, the, the emotional journey that we went on to, to take my dad back to the top of this mountain that we climbed with him as children. Oh, was, beautiful. Was, yeah, beautiful. the mountain was Foynaven in so Foynaven in Sutherland. So, yeah, I've climbed a few mountains in my time. And that was probably the hardest one. I can see your cat's tail. Yeah, she's um, she's like, I, I, I want to come and I want to come and. Oh, I, 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 I'm <laughs> shutting my cat out because she would not be as well behaved. She would be <laughs> on the table. <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit concerned that she's going to jump with her, but she's she's just asking for my attention at the moment, so it's fine. So, yeah, thinking about thinking about role models. Is there anybody who's either you know? living or dead and you mentioned um Frida Kahlo earlier but is there anybody who's been a, a role model to you oh I mean so many people yeah um I mean yes definitely sort of amazing artists that uh you know like Frida Kahlo who are making amazing work around this particular mm -hmm. subject yeah um I mean I I, I have um you know, a part of this sort of adventures is um, meeting, sort of like learning about, um, 
you know, something, a, a challenge that I know nothing about and meeting a community that I, um, have, you know, never met before. And I'm always drawn to amazing women in those communities. So in the mountaineering community, um, I have an amazing mentor called Adele Pennington, who has climbed who more 8,000 meter peaks than any other British woman. Yeah. And, uh, she's been a great inspiration for me in yeah. terms of channel swimming. Um, well, in my book, 21 miles, I interviewed an incredible woman called Jackie Cobell, who holds the record for the slowest ever channel swim. Took her something like 28 hours. Yeah. Um, you know, she's had this sort of really tough life, you know, and she decided like, like me, but old, when she was older than me, that she mm. was, you know, gonna, gonna, gonna swim, you know, mm -hmm. wasn't a swimmer, now is a total legend. So yeah, people, people like that, who, you know, that names that the world doesn't know, but in their communities, they're, they're really well known, um, and have been huge inspirations, as well as, um, you know, people like, like Frida Kahlo, yeah. um, who, who the world do know, you know, those yeah. names. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so there's lots of people who are kind of guiding you on your way, really, and who are just yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. showing you that these things are possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah even if you don't think they are. That yeah. These things are really, really possible. And if you were looking back at you at the beginning of this journey, is there anything that you'd want to say to that person to the Jessica back in back at the beginning of your fertility journey one thing that you'd say to her now based um, on where you are now it's so difficult because I did a webinar last night a live webinar last yeah. night um for a fertility organization and they had questions at the end from, you know, the listeners and someone said, and someone sent me the question, are you happy now? Yeah. And my answer to that is some days I'm happy and some days I'm not happy. Yeah. And some days I do say to my younger self, like do things differently yeah. in all sorts of ways because yeah. this isn't the life you want when you're yeah. 48 you know yeah. um so and and you can make some different decisions now yeah. that might give you a better chance yeah. of not ending up at 48 without children yeah but then other days i go wow okay you didn't have children but you ran a theatre, mm. you set up your own festival, you've written two books, you've swum the channel, you've run the London Marathon, you've, yeah. you're about to climb Everest. Yeah. You've, you know, like, wow, what a life. Yeah. How lucky are you, you know? And so I feel both those things at the same time. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think it depends what day I'm speaking to my younger self. Yeah. I think what's really clear about all the discussion that we've had say in this whole conversation is that you can hold two things at the same time. Yeah. It doesn't have to be either or. Yeah. It doesn't have to be this way or that way, that actually more than one thing can be happening at the same time. And that's and that is And that is true to who I am. Yes. You know, and it's not, you know, and you're interviewing bringing lots of people into your circle and yeah. I think what's interesting is that everyone has a different perspective yes. and I suppose like this is my perspective it comes from my heart it's true yeah. to me and if that um you know speaks to to people then um then that's great but it won't speak to everybody I know that I know that absolutely absolutely but there'll be you know there'll be some people who will think, well, actually, yeah, there is, it is possible to be in more than one place at once. Yeah. And that's, and that's actually, it doesn't have to be fixed. My journey is not fixed. My life is yeah, not fixed. Absolutely. And I think, yeah. um, you know, like we are, 
we are i mean funny enough my book 21 miles was going to be called 21 miles to happiness yeah and my editor said oh i think we should take the happiness away mm. and he was totally right um because actually we focus too much on that i think yeah. and the on on you know in all sorts of ways and the reality is that that human existence is happiness and sadness yeah yeah I mean, one of my favorite books or favorite series of books is the tales of the city series yeah like i said mountain and yes. there's a scene in the book where mrs madrigal is talking to her daughter i don't think i don't know if at this point the daughter knows that Mrs. Madrigal is her mother, but anyway, they're having this discussion. Yeah, yeah. And they pass a shop that's called Sick Room and Party Supplies. Yeah. And and you know, and the daughter the daughter goes, God, that's terrible. What what terrible thing to call a shop sick room and party supplies. Yeah. And Mrs. Madrigal says that's what life is. Yeah. And you have to have both. Yeah. <laughs> and I've always Absolutely. loved I've always loved that quote. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I love it. Yeah, I mean, I love those books, but I don't remember that bit. But I, I absolutely hold that that is the essence of life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's neither one thing nor the other. It's neither one thing nor the other. And the more that you can come to terms with that, yeah, um, the better you will be. And I've got better at coming to terms with that. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's um, a good place to finish on talking and thinking of, you know, life being neither one thing nor the other. I'm just wondering if there's anything else you'd like to say at all before we finish this interview. Mm, um, well, nothing for me. I mean, how's it been? I know you've interviewed several people. Yeah. What I'd love to know from you, like, has any, any of these conversations changed your thinking at all? <laughs> Definitely. I mean, I find that every conversation I have changes my thinking. And what's lovely about my job, because I work as a counsellor, predominantly with people who are childless, not by choice, is that every session I have with my clients um, changes me as much as I hope it changes things for them as yeah. well. And I learn as much from my clients as I hope that they're learning from working with me. So every conversation I've had has really mattered to me in a big way and just thinking about the ones I've had so far um, one of my interviewees was talking about being active and doing something and I'm somebody who when I get in a mess I'll always try and do something I'll always try and be active to get to mm. me out of it and one of the hardest things about my childlessness journey was I ran out of things to do mm. I ran out of I ran out of possibilities. I ran out of options. I tried everything. Um, so I had to take that, my natural active tendency in other directions, which I think I've done. And I'm still doing, because obviously it doesn't just end. I'm still taking it in different directions. So that's, that's really stayed with me um, about being active. And another one of my interviewees was talking very much about the man's perspective. And I found that very eye-opening because it's hard to get into someone else's mind mm. but to listen to his eloquent and mm. amazing um, way of explaining how a man might feel going through infertility mm. was, was yeah massively eye-opening and, so, and slightly heartbreaking as well actually I think that's Robin Hadley isn't it that yeah. you're talking about? and yeah. I am a member of a signed up member of the Robin Hadley fan club he's Thank brilliant you. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And so, yes, it's, it's definitely, um, it's lovely to see ourselves and our journeys reflected in other people's. Mm. And it's also lovely to hear things that we haven't heard before mm. and new ways of seeing things, different ways of seeing things. So, yes, what I'm finding is that um, every time I speak to another person who's willing to really open their heart to me, whether that's in my work or in these interviews or in my everyday life that the the conversation the dialogue always goes both ways mm. always and and i think that's the nature of human communication that hopefully it's going both ways mm. and it's going but you know the, the 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 giving and the taking is going both ways mm. so that's 
I think the th I think the thing that I'm getting the most is people people are really generous mm. and they're really willing to share mm. and that's very moving mm. very important so I think yeah, that's the biggest thing I've I've been given is just people's generosity and willingness to, mm. to, to speak about things that really matter yeah and speaking about all this and recognizing all the different perspectives is what is going to move us is, is going to create progress yeah absolutely and as, as you were saying the importance of listening mm. is really important so the, the more people can share their stories and their journeys and their perspectives the more visible this becomes and, and not just about childlessness but about all sorts of different things mm. you know then hopefully this is going to be um a better world for, for all of us mm. so yeah so i think that's that's the main thing really it's just people's willingness and generosity it's constantly um amazes and, and and makes me feel very grateful that i have these opportunities but i i think you have a like a really um generous sort of energy and um so that comes from from you you yeah. know that, I think that people give i mean yeah i think people are very generous yeah. and honest and but also i think you know your interest and in, uh is encourages that well, well thank you anyway, you need to make yourself an omelet for supper or something with yes. these eggs that just <laughs> i know that my uh, my yeah my uh, my neighbor's egg delivery has come so i will say Thank you very much, Jessica Thank Hepburn, you. adventure activist, Amnesty <laughs> International, this is my favorite one, Amnesty International um, Award for having suffragette spirit. I love That's that. Um, thank you so much for being part of our childless <laughs> circle today. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. Bye. So, I'd like to welcome Victoria to the Childless Circle. My name is Meryl, and this is our, my second interview for the Childless Circle. And as I said, I'm very pleased to welcome Victoria today to join us. I'm just going to ask her to introduce herself. Okay, so, hello, uh, my name is Victoria, and I am a theatre maker and performer from Yorkshire. And I've um, been thinking a little bit about what my journey is to share and it really took a long time so decades rather than um, months or years I think that when I was younger so probably in my early 30s maybe even in late 20s I wasn't sure really what I thought about having kids I just felt um, kind of neutral about it um, and I think part of that was to do with my sexuality and part of it was to do with the fact that I'd had perhaps very little validation um, from my immediate family about taking on a maternal role because mm. I'd been to university and I was um, always kind of working on my career. Yeah. But I met a woman at work who was kind of mentoring me and she didn't have any children. and. She said it was, she'd kind of just ended up in that position because she hadn't really made the time to think about it either way. So at that point, I sort of resolved that I really wanted to make the time to think about it either way. I didn't want it to be an unconscious life experience. I wanted to try and make a conscious choice mm -hmm. about whether to have children or not. Um, and I started to have tentative conversations with girlfriends around that time and with myself um, and with myself. Yeah. But I think that I wasn't with anybody who had a particular interest in that. And I, I think I probably wasn't very sure about it myself either. So then I started to think about it as something that I might do as a single woman. Yeah. And I was in a position by this point. So now I'm probably getting in definitely into my mid 30s maybe even sort of later 30s mm. that i had a, um, a good income and i decided to stay in a particular job for quite a long time because i thought oh if i was a single parent 
job's got flexibility and um, I've got a disposable income and I bought a sensible car. And so I was sort of kind of building a lifestyle that would uh, transition if I did become a parent. So in my head, I was kind of like trying it on, I think, as an idea, an identity. And I went on a course run by the Donor Conception Network, which was for single women and lesbians about um, donor material. Yeah. And that was in one way really eye-opening about what the possibilities were and then in another way scary about the responsibility of it. Mm. Um, and so I, I, so after that I just felt a bit stuck. I wasn't, I just wasn't really confident enough to proceed. Yeah. But then I, I met a partner that I was seeing for a short period of time who was very encouraging and very politically, yes, you can do it if you want. And yes, lesbians could do it. And yes, why not? Make it happen. And all of a sudden, I just felt this real new passion for yeah. trying to become a parent. Um, uh, but then that person changed their mind. And I felt really stuck again. And what that... Um, what, what I realized through that was that my ideas of family came from a very kind of heteronormative sort of idea. Mm. So I had a really strong paradigm, this idea that children came from being in a loving relationship and a certain kind of family. Yeah. And so I kept getting stuck when I wasn't in that position. Yeah. Uh, but as soon as I did have someone in my life who was really encouraging and there was a sense of us doing it together, then I then I really, really sort of swung into it. Yeah. Um, so um, that that was kind of a big moment for me to sort of realise that. Yeah. Um, and to sort of process. And there were other things to sort of process, like, like you know, I'm very close to my dad and I was thinking, oh, you know, you know, how would that relationship work, you know, if there wasn't an active father in a relationship? And it just seemed to be so much to think about. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, in the end, decided to find out by doing. I thought, I'm not sure enough. Yeah. So I'm going to find out by doing. I'm going to try. And if I'm excited and I want to try more, then that will tell me this is something to do. And if yeah. I go, no, it's not for me, it will be something that I can just back off from. Yeah. And and then at this point I was definitely in my late thirties and I had a new partner who was unsure because we were in quite a young relationship but was supportive of me trying. And so we tried home inseminating with um donor sperm from a European sperm bank and then I tried an IUI and then it, ultimately I had IVF which was self funded. Yeah. And so, obviously, I was prepared to go quite far. Yeah. <laughs> and I think what I found is, is that um, in some ways, I'd never really given the voice of potentially being a mother a lot of airtime. And then so as soon as I did, you know, it, it really got hold. Yeah. Um, and particularly going through a process of being kind of medicalized on that journey. Yeah you get given all kinds of different advice and you have to research all kinds of things and people, you know, you start being encouraged to visualize things or believe in things or, you know, affirm things. And so that sort of supported the momentum of, of me really immersing myself in, in wanting to be a mother. Um, anyway, ultimately I was unsuccessful with all the trials and tribulations of IVF, which are the many, and actually I became quite poorly. Mm. and my relationship also uh, broke down and got back together and broke down again and was really um, tested during that time yeah and so I just couldn't carry on anymore I just physically or emotionally couldn't carry on so I had to kind of park it mm. in order to recover and it kind of stayed parked I just couldn't see another way to no. proceed because I didn't want to repeat the process that I'd been doing, which was not being confident enough to proceed on my own. Although actually probably by this point, it was probably more the fact that my age was becoming more of a factor and I didn't have the kind of supportive relationship that I would have ideally liked. And, I, and it just became clear that physically I was 
uh, my chances were very low because of my age. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and so some time has passed now. So this is probably five years ago that I'm speaking from now. Yeah. And, uh, I'm in a, a new relationship now. Uh, with somebody who doesn't particularly want children right. um, and sometimes I still think about it but it doesn't seem to be a real transaction anymore so I feel like I'm now I'm living in a kind of a beyond place yeah that was a very long journey but it felt like it was a really iterative process for me it was yeah. really something that kind of moved very slowly over time for a long time yeah and it sounds as if in a way it would come in kind of spirals. So you'd go through a spiral and then you, thinking about it, you said you kind of had conversations with your, with people you, you know, the person you were then with and you had conversations with yourself. And then it would yes. kind of go into another spiral and you kind of invited the idea in with thinking of having IVF and donor conception. And then the, the kind of desire really kicked in. And then, yeah. the, and then that kind of went on and then you got, put on. it seems like you're kind of spiraling downwards a bit now and again feeling like you're in a place beyond so it does seem like you went went up to a kind of peak and then came came down or is coming down again into a yeah. kind of yeah I think, yeah i think so i think so yeah um, yeah yeah but it does sound like a very very long and very very painful journey mm. but with, with loads of different phases to it yeah definitely there was definitely different phases where you know, I was thinking about different aspects of it, either practically or emotionally, and yeah. kind of keeping to coming to terms with where I thought I was at and what I thought was possible, and then coming changes, and then you have to go through that all that process again, yeah. and then again, and again. And also having to think about what is a family, and what makes a family, which is probably something that straight people might not need to think about in the same way. So there, was, there are other questions that you sometimes had to ask yourself? Yeah, I think so. And I think I possibly have thought about that more since trying, yeah. in terms of thinking about what would, you know, how I'd find fulfillment now. And, yeah. you know, if family something is important to me, then actually, what does that look like? Yeah. 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 And what are some of the things that have helped you in? getting into a beyond place, do you think? Are there any things that have kind of made that easier to process what's happened and to heal? If indeed think, that's where you are. Well, I think fundamentally it's, it's a lot to do with time. Mm. You know, there was um, the immediate sort of uh, difficulty of it felt like nothing thing would make it any easier you know yeah. and a certain amount of that like with any kind of grief just does take time yeah. and you know quite a lot of time has passed for me now yes but i also think that you know i have a personal belief about trying to keep moving trying not to get stuck in any yeah. one kind of emotional place and and when i felt uh, stronger i did practically sort of sit down and, and think through and be quite sort of methodical and think mm -hmm. okay um you know what what would make me happy what makes me feel fulfilled what yeah. are the ingredients yeah. of a family and and uh, was quite sort of pragmatic in trying to be really specific and think okay well what does that actually look like and how else might i be able to access those things yeah. that i want into my life um you know and then i started experimenting with them which is partly um you know how i came about with the show i've made on that topic yeah which i saw part of at the barbican back yeah. in the fertility fest which hence us having this conversation yes yeah yeah so the show was very much about actively exploring as you say things that could make you happy how to be happy and was doing the show in itself part of the healing process do you think so writing and performing and obviously you're still performing it um yeah has that has that been healing and supportive making theatre about about your situation 
I don't know. I I didn't um, I didn't make the show as part of a healing process, no. really. What I did was I tried to think about the things that made me happy. And I go right back to when I was younger and things I wanted to do with my life and ambitions that I had. And yeah. I always really wanted to perform. Yes. Um, and I would do work, I did at the time working theatre, but it wasn't in a creative, cap uh, creative capacity yeah. in terms of performing. Yeah. And so I, my intention was to perform, was to make a vehicle so that I could perform. Yeah. And I went on a course about how to make your own show. And on the course, I was encouraged to think about autobiographical material. And so this came out as a theme. And one of the things that was really important to me was I didn't want to make the show as part of my own therapy or to kind of be cathartic. Um, but doing something that I enjoyed, doing something that had always been a passion, being creative, that was for me, because of my personal interest, part of making myself happy. Yeah. It might be something completely different for somebody else, you know, somebody yeah. might want to take up hang gliding or, <laughs> you know, yeah. course or whatever. But yeah. being creative was part of the process for me of becoming happier. Yeah. Um, I think the, what the experience of the show has done has challenged me in terms of how open I am, comfortable being about my own experience. Yeah. Because it's quite clear to the audience, I think, that the show is autobiographical. Yeah. And I chose, when I was going through some of those um, earlier experiences, not really to talk about them. Yeah. And um, not really to be very public about it. And I, I think I was a bit troubled by sort of shame as well, yeah. uh, particularly when I was unsuccessful. And so I was quite... Um, uncomfortable talking about it but then because it became part of an artistic process I was in I had to deal with that yeah. and, um, and I'm still dealing with that to, yeah. to different degrees and, and more and more so over time and so where the, the show has helped me I think is been less about process and the material but perhaps has moved me from a, a place where I was very private about it to yeah. one where I'm, I'm, I'm more comfortable about it yes absolutely in some contexts and still yes. not in others well yes absolutely because it's very i imagine it's one thing being on the stage um no matter how many people you're performing in front of the people who are while it's autobiographical you're still playing a role and yeah. it's really another thing to be open in a different context so you wouldn't expect that yeah. to transfer from context to context yeah and i and i was able to construct the show in a way that made me feel safe. Yeah. So some some bits of the performance I deliver live yeah. and some bits of the performance are pre-recorded and some of the more difficult bits are pre-recorded because that's, you know, what I, for other reasons, other artistic reasons as well, but, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm trying to sort of take care of myself and take care of the audience yeah. through, the, through the way it's made. Yeah, and I imagine that there will be lots of people seeing your play who have had similar experiences, obviously, all our experiences are completely unique. You know, we've all gone on different yeah. journeys, but there are commonalities. So yeah, there'll be yeah. more people watching your play who will find some bits of it, either practical aspects of it or the emotional aspects of it very familiar. So yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think I've tried to make something which is quite open. You know, it's not, it's not a play with a very linear story or a very linear timeline. I've tried to make it open to take in lots of kind of parts of that map or that journey and also that apply to other things other than um having children or not having a relationship or not you know just heartbreak generally how do we reinvent ourselves how do we you know find this elusive happiness or whatever it is that we're looking for in life yeah absolutely and it sounds like one of the things um, that you might potentially advocate to other people is finding something that you're passionate about that you've always wanted to do. Um, so you always wanted to perform. Um, yeah. And it wasn't so much that the play was cathartic in itself, but the opportunity to create your own piece, to perform it, was supportive and healing, regardless of the subject material. So it could be that for somebody else, as you say, it's hang gliding and yeah. for somebody else it's writing and for somebody else it's having owning a rescue pet 
you know, and caring for a rescue pet. And there are a million and one ways to happiness in a way. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, it wasn't just the, the show. I thought about, I thought about community a lot and how much time I have available for my friends and, yeah. you know, how I make the most of time with uh, the family that I have, um, what kind of home I want, yeah. um, how comfortable I am. Yeah. pursuing my own happiness is it selfish you know yeah. how how okay am I am with that yeah. um, and taking risks you know I think I'd um it felt like a big risk to start performing again particularly as a as a middle-aged woman yeah. and uh, for want of a better phrase which I'm sure there must be a better phrase by the way um and but you know after the experience I'd had I felt a bit like I didn't have a great deal to lose and so it was time yeah. to take the risk and also i felt like my life had been like sort of frozen for a few years because like when i was uh, actively in a process of ivf you're waiting all the time i feel like i couldn't change anything you can't plan anything and so it just felt that you know anything that was new or that was fresh or that had some energy to it you know was you know became became helpful yeah and i think that thing you said a few minutes ago about keeping moving forward yeah. Keeping things moving forward rather than getting stuck. Seems like that yeah. was really important to you as well. Yes, yeah. And not to let things just sit there. I wonder, we've talked a bit about some of the things that have been supportive for you, and I wonder if there's anything that made the experience of childlessness more difficult or had a sort of negative impact on your healing or perhaps anything that was different for you as a queer woman that made the process more difficult. And I know you mentioned a bit about heteronormativity and how that was a, something that you had to kind of think your way through. But yeah, I'm just thinking what, what if anything made it harder? I think, I think for me, because it felt very tied up with um, an idea of a relationship. Yeah. And I think the fact that I lost my relationship the, the, the relationship that had been invested in this process at the same time as sort of failing in a process, mm. that really felt difficult because it felt like a kind of double whammy. Yeah. You know, um, if you think of family in terms of child or partner, I ended up, you know, really struggling with an absence in both of those, both of those roles. Um, and I think I had this real attachment to an idea of happy ever after. Yeah. which I did not want to let go of, you mm -hmm. know, and I fought tooth and nail for that. And I think really letting go of that was the most difficult thing. Yeah. But because um, I hung on to it for such a long time, but actually because of trying to hang on to it, I was trying to make things perfect all the time. I was over compromising. I was striving, you know, mm -hmm. and it caused me a great deal of, of pain trying to um you know hang on to an idea of you know what what a successful future was i guess mm -hmm. but that definitely made it harder and i think i think also the the kind of sense of shame that i mentioned yeah earlier you know and i i remember going through you know waves of shame in other contexts when i was younger you know about my body as a woman or my sexual identity or sexual preferences or um well all kinds of things really you know and i think i mean maybe it's the same for everybody but i always i, I think shame mm. a particularly repressive thing yeah. in my life and so to feel that around this topic mm. um you know i had to once i'd been able to name it yeah yeah. It, was much easier. it was much easier to sort of work with. Yeah. Um, so, so those things were difficult. Yeah. Um, in terms of kind of a, a, a queer or a um, gay experience, I, I don't know. I think, I think probably something about being so... Um, the need to be so self-determining yeah there's no sort of social there's not the same social grease in terms of oh you meet you know you meet someone 
there's an expectation that you're going to have children so you're both on a similar page about it physically you know it can happen yeah. uh, more naturally i'm using invert commas yeah um, you have more access to trying yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's but the idea of like designing my own future yeah and paying to design my own future and being willful enough to go well actually i want this and i'm going to try mm -hmm. and make it happen yeah. without that social validation felt you know that felt like quite a big thing yeah and I, I struggled with that um a little bit yeah um and obviously the practicalities which we've talked about yeah. I find it, I think I also felt a bit, um, because I did go to speak to my GP about it and ultimately for um, treatment in relation to uh, trying to get pregnant. And I think I felt very unconfident going mm -hmm. as a single woman or a woman in a gay relationship. Mm -hmm. And not, I didn't really know what my rights were or what I was entitled to. And it, it felt, you know, that how I evidenced my desire or what I tried before and even down to you know things like what what was legal what wasn't legal how you know how things I might want to try yeah. outside of the medical context yeah. um I think all of that all of that felt you know um different, you know challenging and yeah. more stuff to research and then you the more you research the more questions you have and the more you don't know what to believe and the more there is to process and so yeah all of all of those things i think was particular to a queer experience and the additional complexity and questions yeah. that come up with yeah that. absolutely did you have any or do you have any role models or people who've inspired you along the way i don't i don't along the way no not not so much really i think that was part of the difficulty is that i think you know i lacked role models you know i didn't really know very many queer parents or or, or um single women who were had um children proactively by choice yeah. uh, alone uh, i think that is different now i think yeah. now i do know quite a lot of people um in a number of different circumstances but when i first started trying because you know it took you know i was a yeah. couple of decades journey that i'm speaking about yeah i didn't um you know i think that was that was part of the, the struggle that i didn't have those role models yeah i think the lesbians that i met who had just been just who had a kind of fuck it attitude if i can say that yeah, yeah. i found it inspiring the ones who've just gone fuck it i'm gonna do this it'll be fine yeah. uh, i'm entitled you know who had that a kind of uh politicalness about their you know queer identity yeah. uh, I find inspiring yeah um, and and that's probably all I can say about that I mean now this year uh, well we met you know through Facility Fest yeah and that obviously is part of my sort of slightly starting to move on journey mm -hmm. but that was in some ways a real watershed uh, mm -hmm. because I met a lot of people there and I found out a lot of support organisations that I just didn't know existed before. Yeah. And there was, a, there was a lot of people speaking very openly and without shame about their different experiences. And I think that was another encouragement for me. And you know, that has been helpful now. Um, and like, I met Jodie Day there who runs Gateway Women. Yeah. I didn't know anything about her organisation and obviously Jessica really runs Facility Fest. And I think these those these very visible support organizations that i'm finding now yeah um, oh they're not perhaps role models but they are um you know I, i'm getting something really positive about now i'm connecting with with that kind even though it's it's not it's later in my journey i'm still getting something out of the visibility and um Pride's not the right word, but sort of stand upness yeah. um, from other people who were involved with those those kinds of organisations. So to hear people telling their stories out loud and without shame, yeah, and to find out that there are other organisations out there like Gateway Women, like the More to Life Day at Fertility Fest, yeah. is really something that's supportive in itself, no matter where you are on your journey. To be able to stand, yeah. up, this is who I am. Yeah. 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 
yeah to be able to put it out there without shame which i think is something that your you know your play saying putting it out there actually and other for other women that might be a and not just women for other people that might be a, a source of support in itself to hear your story yeah well and there's a sense of um community even though it might not be a immediately closely connected community there is there is a sense of yes. you know that, that you know there are significant numbers of people around yes. who have experiences that relate to this topic yeah absolutely based on you know based on sort of looking back on the journey that you've been on in the last you know, several number of years um is there anything you would say to somebody else who might be much earlier in their journey through childlessness. So is there any sort of word of advice that you might give or something you might say to them? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe something which, like it sounds really pat, but something like, you know, you're okay. You know, whatever happens yeah. is okay. It will be enough. Yeah. Because I think, but you know, from my journey, like I felt okay. I wasn't a woman who was going, oh, I need to be a mother, I need to be a mother. And it was like a really burning present thing. It was something which was a much slower evolved. Yeah. So when I started practically experimenting with becoming a mother, like I was like, well, I'm all right. So if it doesn't work out, I'll still be all right. Yeah. And then actually, I really wasn't all right at the end of it. Mm -hmm. I felt battered by the experience and I felt a massive sense of loss mm -hmm. and I don't know how much of that was as a result of the process yeah. um, and the loss of sense of self through the process mm -hmm. and how much is a grief that probably would have been there anyway I don't know but like I am okay now yeah um, so I don't know I, I you know I would I would say you know, think think about all the ways you're okay now. You yeah. know, yeah. all the things that you have that are there now. Maybe like even write them down, record them. Like have some kind of touchstone because, particularly if you're going to go into some kind of intervention or medical process, because I do feel like it's very very disorientating and you you forget. You know, your your sense of perspective gets changed and things become very heightened or yeah. you're very high risk or you know, you, your your emotional investment is changed yeah. by all of this, um, all of the different voices that yeah. come into play. And I think if you've got some kind of touchstone of, yeah. you know, this is this is what you know about what you're prepared to do, or this these are your values in relation to it, or this is how you're kind of okay, yeah. uh, then you know you've got you've got something to sort of step back in with. I think. That, yeah, to hold on to the fact that whatever happens, you're okay. Yeah. Uh, sounds like a really important and strong message. And I also think that's probably a really good place for us to finish. Um, <laughs> whatever happens, you're okay. And yeah. I don't know if there's anything else that you'd like to say at all. Well, we I only just that when I was thinking about this interview and I was making some notes and I was thinking about the difference between me then and the, and oh, me yeah. now and I was thinking I, in some ways I'm more confident now like mm -hmm. I was always an externally confident person mm -hmm. but going through this process mm -hmm. and the years of thinking about it, it made me really have to look in all the corners of my identity yeah and all the kind of hidden beliefs that i had about things and to like re-examine what matters to me yeah and in some ways that i feel like that has stood me in some good stead yeah. and i am i am confident you know now in a different kind of way about who i am and um what i want yeah and and what what's okay what's okay with me brilliant Thank you so much, Victoria, for, for coming to be part of our Childless Circle. You're very um, welcome. It's been Thank wonderful you to speak to you. And I've been it's been yeah, really great to hear your story. And and I shall I shall go away from this definitely holding on to the fact that, you know, no matter what I've experienced in my journey, that I also am okay. So yeah. that's a really strong message. So thank you very much. That's been brilliant. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.
I, I'd like to welcome you, Lauren, to the Childless Circle. And Thank you. We're going to have a little bit of chat about your childless journey and your thoughts about it and anything that you might like to say to other people who've been in your position. But first of mm. all, I'd just like you to introduce yourself. Mm. So I'm Lauren and I'm 55 and three quarters. <laughs> Gosh, I can't believe I'm that age, actually. I really feel, um, I feel like I'm definitely in my next phase of my life. You know, I'm in my early elderhood, as Jodie likes to call it. And um, so I live in Northwest London and I've got a cat, Mr. Marvo, who might make a guest appearance. He's in the room. He's in the room. He's likely to jump up at some point. Brilliant. Just thought I'd warn everyone. (laughs) <laughs> and um, and I've been involved with Gateway Women since, uh, well, kind of actively since 2017. But it, Gateway Women's been on my radar for longer than that. Yeah. I was one of those scaredy cat women who kind of kept looking at it on the website and then running in the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. And then, so in 2017, I did the year-long Plan B, which uh, with Jody, and and then after that, she asked me if I would like to train with her, so that I could run the weekend courses, the Reignite weekends, yeah, which has been incredible for me because I've learned so much about the whole the whole concept of childlessness. Yeah how it impacts on women in so many different ways and yet we all have a commonality there yeah and it's been part of my healing process as well so it's been wonderful to kind of do that for the last I've been doing that for the last year and a half wow I know I I didn't realize that till the beginning of this week has it gone just like that yeah yeah just like that yeah amazing and I've you know made contact with quite a few women on by doing those courses and it's been wonderful it's been food for the soul really and yeah really nice really nice and I continue to do it you know I've got plans to do six next year um, which I'm thrilled about and then next year as well I'm being trained currently as we speak to do the year-long program that I myself did in 2017 and that's where we come back for 2020. Yes. Wow. So it's yeah. a very exciting year ahead for you. Mm. There's going to mm. be a lot of new things coming into your life. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And it's lovely to hear that you're going to be running the year-long Plan B because, of course, that's where we met and became friends. Yeah. And it's been very inspiring to see how we all grew and changed from that experience and how our friendships have um, continued and actually, I think, grown stronger. Yeah, absolutely. I was talking about this the other day and how I had actually got to the point where I believed, before I did the year-long course, I actually believed I was rubbish at being a friend and that I was really bad at friendships. And I think some of it is because I withdrew myself from from people and if I went into a group or if I went into a room where there was people I was automatically on the defensive thinking oh god is someone going to ask me if I've got children Mm. oh god is someone going to go on and on about their own children Um, so I think I had put up a real barrier yeah Plus, I'd lost quite a lot of friends along the way from from them becoming mothers themselves. Mm. You know, and you, you kind of come out of that circle, don't you? Yeah. So over my sort of 20s and 30s, I started gradually losing more and more friends. Yeah. And I actually kind of took it in inwardly and believed I was rubbish at friendship. Wow. I know. That really surprises me. I guess I that... I've only known you more recently than that. Um, yeah. And it's, but yeah, it both surprises me and saddens me that you internalise those views about yourself. And I really hope that the experience of doing the Plan B and the fact that we, our Plan B is still all meet up on a regular basis has helped to change that. 
Yeah, definitely. Because do you remember, I think it was around May time in that year long. Yeah. Um, plan B, that I finally got what sisterhood was. Yeah. And what it meant. Yes. Up until that, so that it took me till what? I was 53 and a half to realise that women can be supportive of one another yeah. and that they can, they can be there for you. Yes, absolutely. Um, so yes, that was a major revelation for me, major revelation. Yeah. What do you, you, you said earlier that doing the Reignite workshops has been a really amazing experience for you. Um, meeting and working with and supporting so many women through the two-day Reignite programme, which is a programme that's run by Gateway Women, which is headed up by Jodie Day. Um, mm. What do you think you've learned um, from running those workshops? Obviously, you're giving a lot to the participants, to the women who come on those workshops, but I was wondering what you may have learned or gained from doing them. What about myself? Do you mean? Well, in any way, because I just said when we teach, we learn as much as yeah. we're teaching. <laughs> yes. Eek. Yeah, we do. Um, I think the power of connection yeah. between human beings, you know, the fact that, that we're all childless women, that kind of brings us in the room together. Yeah. But the, the human connection and how healing that is. Yeah cannot be underestimated yeah. it's massive it's massive and i think i think it goes quite a long way that the reignite weekend goes a long way to healing women just by virtue of you being a group of women in the same room together for two days where you are not judging each other and and then begin to sort of relax and support one another yeah it's just amazing yes yeah. amazing and i think you know that's the sort of inner reflection on how i think society is losing something by the fact that we're not in tribes anymore we you know we're losing our sense of community and that that is so vital yeah it, it it's just vital to our very being i think yeah absolutely um, yeah so yeah that, that's been huge yeah. huge learning for me yeah. because I think before you know I said about how I was quite defensive about yeah. you know I'd go into a room and I'd think oh god because I had shame around being childless mm -hmm. so I was carrying this shame as this sort of coat if you like walking in thinking oh god you know I was I, I mean like physically mm -hmm. I think I'm even like this yeah. and um and um just learning to, that, that you can take that off. Yeah. You don't, you don't have to wear the coat of shame, you really don't. So, so yes, that's been a real powerful thing for me as well. What do you think it was that gave you that coat of shame in particular? Because I think it's something that's common to lots of childless people that we feel, we tend to feel ashamed. Um, yeah. I wonder if there's anything about your experience or your journey that particularly gave you that that coat of shame? Um, I think it was a combination of, I grew up in the 80s where it was, there was this expectation that you could have it all. Yeah. You know, you could go to college, you could go to university, you get your qualifications, then you get your job, then you get your wonderful career, and then you get the partner, and then you have the family, and everything's hunky-dory, and it's all lovely, and rosy in the garden. Yeah. And I bought into that hugely. I just, I did think that I could have everything. And I actually think now you, it's not possible. No. I really don't think it's possible. Not, not to the level that it was sold to me in the 1980s anyway. Yeah. And um, so I think the shame comes partly because I didn't complete that whole picture. Yeah. You know, I had the, I had the qualification bit, so tick on the education yeah. and then tick on the career. Yes. Because I used to be, uh, you know, I qualified as a solicitor and then I ended up working for myself. So you could say that's a tick. Yeah. 
tick with the partnership to a certain level. I, I never felt quite that I was with the right person. Yeah. Um, but I think that was about other issues in my life, my childhood and yeah. stuff like that. But the fact that I didn't have a family was a massive non-tick. Yeah. And yeah, a big gap. It, it was huge, yeah, really, really big gap. And and I think society expected me to have a family. And then I would get embarrassed when people said, you know, in my 30s, there was a lot of, you know, because people don't know what to say, I think. They don't know what to say if you say that you haven't got children. And so there's this real awkwardness and it ends up invariably being uh, a, a non-productive conversation and a non uh, a very unsatisfactory conversation on both sides because yeah. they feel awkward and they don't know what to say to you and then they try and placate things by saying you know in my 30s it was very much you've got loads of time you don't want to worry about them now or you know that they would say um, well motherhood's not all it's cracked up to be you, you, we, we all know all these phrases, don't we? Because they're, so, they're so familiar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We've heard them like a million times. Have my children. <laughs> yes. Yes. You can have my children. You go, okay. Um, so, and then there was an awkwardness on my side because I knew that that was what I really wanted and somehow it wasn't happening. Yeah. And I didn't know what to do about it either. Uh, plus, I think there was a bit of ignorance on my part as well. You know, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say that I'm. You know, I kind of, I like to think of myself as quite clever. Yeah. But I was not clever at all no. over the whole uh, fertility side of things. No. I don't even know whether I could have had children. Yeah. Now, isn't that unbelievable? Yeah. That I really wanted to have children, and yet I never got myself checked to find out whether that was possible. Why would you? Yeah, we just get on the path and assume that everything's going to be okay. We don't even think about it. No. I just kind of thought, well, somehow it would happen, and that I felt embarrassed if it wasn't. Yeah. And yet I wasn't doing anything about it either. No. So, um, yeah. So I. So I think the shame comes from a combination of those things, yeah. really. Yeah. And, and so, you know, let's face it, society is a very pro society. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we live in a society where we're told on a regular basis that the most joy and purpose in your life comes from being a parent. Yeah. Yes. And that if you're not a mother, somehow you're less than. Yeah. And that you won't understand, you won't have as much empathy as other people. See, that infuriates me. Yeah. That absolutely infuriates me. Say that. Yeah. Like, because you, you can have empathy for something, or you can have an understanding of someone else's situation still. Yeah. Why is it that you actually have to have had the direct experience to be able to have sympathy, understanding, empathy? I don't, that, that doesn't if you think about it, it doesn't apply in any other sphere of our lives but somehow we've got so pro that yeah. the only way that you would understand about what it's like to be a mother is to be a mother yeah. it's crazy it's crazy to think that absolutely and there's yeah. nothing else in life that's as important you know that your life begins when you become a mother you finally mm -hmm. understand what love is Mm. Um, and if you're being fed those kind of stories then you think well if my life's if I'm not going to be a mother is my life not going to begin am I not going to know happiness yeah, yeah. obviously that yeah that's not true our lives begin and carry on and are fulfilling and purposeful and happy without having children that's not to say that we didn't really want them yeah and live a good life without them oh definitely yeah. Definitely, and I mean that that was the whole thing about plan B because the, the main reason I went on plan B is because 
after I, when I had a realization that I wasn't going to have a family of my own in any shape or form, mm -hmm. I kind of hit a massive brick wall. I just zoned out of life. Yeah. I think someone in our group said they pressed the pause button. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that really describes it so well, because that's, that's how I felt. I just thought, well, if it's not going to happen, my life is always going to be somehow a little bit meaningless. Mm. And if it's going to be meaningless, then what's the point of making any effort yeah. in any aspect of my life? Yeah. So I completely don't doubt. And, and I finally got to, because I, I started watching um, the website, Gateway Women website. I started looking at it when I was about 50. Yeah. But it took me till I was 53 to book on the year on the plan yeah. the course because I kept it was too painful to keep looking at it because I just thought no no I'm not gonna go there because I knew that it was gonna be I would have probably have to look at my grief and I didn't really want to because yeah. I was zoned out I wanted that numbness I didn't want to feel anything yeah. and I was frightened that if I went on the plan B I would I would feel something and it might be too painful for me and I might not be able to cope with it. It might, it might yeah, it might break me yeah. somehow. Um, so yes, I was really kind of frightened to do that, but, but I then got to the point where I just thought the numbness was more painful than facing the, the prospect that I might have some pain by dealing with my grief yeah it became a balancing thing you know like which which one becomes more painful in the end yeah. and the numbness became the more painful thing. do i stay stuck or do i do i get into the grief and then get out the other side yeah 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 but when you're looking at it initially you don't know that you're going to get out the other side do you? there is another just, side actually. yeah exactly you don't even know what it looks like no. so um you know yeah it's like that phrase isn't it you know when your foot is in the bear trap that's all you're thinking about is the pain at the time you can't actually think of anything else as if the, the lake of your grief is so huge that you can't see the other side you don't even no. know if there is another side to the lake no. that goes on forever yeah yeah you don't know the shape of it what it looks like you don't know anything. Yeah. how it's going to feel when you're in there yeah and then eventually yeah. you get out at the other shore and you're like, actually, okay, this is not so bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah. the life I wanted, but it's not so bad. <laughs> In fact, yeah. there are some things about it that are really good. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, that's what I think now. Mm. Um, but obviously, I think it's, that's why it's so important to do the grief work, isn't it? You yeah. Know, you and I know. And it's... it's it's never as bad as fear of how it's going to be. Yeah. But that, that's like anything in life, isn't it? Yeah. When you actually do something that you're fearful of doing, you just invariably you think, oh, that wasn't, that wasn't so bad. Yeah. And I think this is just the same, really. It's just a, a human, a natural human reaction, isn't it? That Definitely. The unknown is terrifying. Yeah. Thinking that yeah. feelings are going to last forever. Mm. It's terrifying. So why would we want to, to to start that process thinking it might last forever? Yeah. 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 Thinking that maybe we want it anyway. So we may as well stay there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So um, I'm so glad that I did the plan B because yeah. I think I'd still be in zoned out land. Yeah. Switched off. Completely. Yeah. I mean, and now I've got you know, real motivation to do all sorts of things. Yeah. And I feel, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, re I'm remembering myself as how I used to be in my 30s. Yeah. It's like I'm reconnecting with my m mentality and um, like the way I used to live in my 30s. Mm -hmm. um, except I'm not. Yeah. And, but in a way, it's kind of even more beautiful yeah. because I've got a little bit of wisdom now that I didn't have in my first. Yeah. So, yeah. 
how do you see yourself now? Standing on the other shore. Yeah. How would you describe yourself now compared to the person you were before you, you know, when you, when you were wearing that shame coat and you cut yourself off from people? Yeah. Yeah, so how would you describe the Lauren, the Lauren de Vere that we have right now? Uh, I think I'm much more present. Mm. You know, I do this, um, I do this uh, email every day to a woman I've never met, and we are on day 211 today, where we send an email to each other, and it literally takes five, ten minutes in the morning, and we tell each other what we're grateful for. Yeah. Uh, as having happened the previous day. Yeah. So it's always done, you know, the day ahead. And I really have a gratitude for life that I never had before. But like truly grateful and it doesn't doesn't have to be anything particularly big. Mm. You know, like yesterday I I wrote well this morning I wrote that I was grateful yesterday that I had somewhere to live and that I wasn't suffering like those Chinese nationals did in the <sighs> in that lorry and I just think oh my god mm -hmm. so I have that kind of gratitude where I just look at other people's lives and I just think I am I am genuinely blessed yeah. I genuinely feel that I don't I'm not saying that kind of like a happy face and you yeah. know I I really feel that in my heart that I yeah. am so lucky mm -hmm. that I live where I live I've got a roof over my head I, I don't worry about when I'm next to going to eat no. and I can have gratitude for just seeing a nice flower yeah in a flower either in the border yeah or, or in the shop or, or I can have gratitude that Mr Marvel's come up and give me a cuddle you know I'm just it's just, I never had that gratitude. I never had that sense of gratitude before in life. So I think that's very much changed about me. And, and sort of connected with that is that I feel very present yeah. in life now. Yeah. I kind of, I'm looking towards the future quite a bit, but I always have done that. Yeah. Um, so I think people tend to be, you know, they either tend to look at how things used to be or they're tending to look yeah. at how things will be. And I, I've always been a sort of future kind of woman. Yeah. Um, but I'm very much more, but having said that, I am very much more present. Yeah. So every day I'm just taking things kind of at their own pace. Yeah. I'm less forceful. I'm not trying to push the river anymore. Yeah. Um, so I, I go much more with the flow than I used to. Yeah. And I think, well, thinking about it, the mm. other big change for me is about self care. Yeah. I look after myself so much better and I give myself a much less hard time. Mm. You remember when we went on the year long course, you know, like I had the shitty committee, like I would have a whole load of characters in my head. There'd be like a room full of them and they were shouting over each other sometimes. Yeah. And they'd be saying things like, you stupid woman, who do you think you are? I'd be absolutely, you know, revolting really, saying really, really insulting myself and really, yeah, being nasty to myself. Yeah. And the shitty committee now have really quietened down. There's very little, it's not a room full of them now. There's like maybe one or two still hanging around. Yeah. And every now and again, they, they want to kind of say their, say their shitty stuff to me. Yeah. Yeah. But, but for the most part, they've just, I'm just didn't pay the, I just don't pay them any attention anymore. So I think they've maybe left the room. Yeah. Yeah, because you're not giving them the airtime. No. No. And so 
So yes, yeah, so my shooting has really reduced in size, but also self care has been about, um, you know, like I, I really make sure that I go to yoga, mm. my yoga classes as much as possible. There's very little that sways me off yeah. not going to a yoga class or a body balance class yeah. because it's really important to me to kind of keep supple and, and just be in touch with my physical body in that way. Yeah. You know, be connected with myself physically and how I eat. Yeah. Um, and, and also things like if I start taking on too much, but I rein myself in, yeah yeah and like whoa you're just you're just trying to fit in too much here lovely yeah. and you know you need to kind of calm down uh whereas before i'd really push myself um so yeah so that's changed yeah. quite a lot uh and then you know when i try and eat well yeah sleep still not an expert on sleep really yeah. kind of Good times. I seem to go through phases of sleep yeah. where I sleep really well and then I, I don't for some reason. Um, so I haven't mastered that one yet. Um, but yeah, I do take care of myself a lot better. And I hang out with people that I really want to hang out with as well. Yeah. Yeah, like, um, like all of us that are on the plan B, you know, we have a social every month and I try to make as many of them as possible. Yeah it's really important to keep connected in that way and still see one another yeah socially. absolutely and i'm you know and i will i will do that and if there's two things that are going on and one's the, the be social and one is something else and they clash i will do the be social yeah because it's really important to me to stay in contact with with my fellow bees from the mm -hmm. 2017 year long course. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So I think you start, I've sort of prioritised things and really worked out what's important to me and what's less important yeah. to me. And what's detrimental to me as well. I could ditch that. Yeah. And that might be steering away from some people. Not, not you know, not being brutal about it, but yeah. maybe seeing less certain mm -hmm who may be a little bit energy vampire-ish. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I'm just being a little bit guarded about that, I think. In keeping yourself, keeping yourself well, keeping yourself safe. Yeah. 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 In many different ways. So self-care for you seems to happen in many different ways. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah, that's been a real big change. Brilliant. And who, who, if anybody, have been the role models who've kind of gone ahead of you and supported you? You may, maybe people you know or people you don't know. But is hmm. there anybody who you kind of have looked at and gone, that, that's really helpful knowing that this person is out there that hmm. gives you some optimism for what I could do, for what I could achieve? Blimey, there's so many, aren't there? <laughs> Maybe they're replacing your shitty committee. Maybe. <laughs> a, role yeah, model, a role model committee. <laughs> yeah. Go, um, yeah. Go, Lauren, you can do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Gosh, that's like that question, isn't it? Like, who would you like to have for dinner? I know, you know it's a horrible could... question. I've asked, you a, I've asked you a horrible question. Um, yeah. No, it, um, well, obviously, Jodie's a real role model. Yeah. Um, because, you know, she does fantastic work and continues to do it and yeah. is a real um a real power force out there and a real voice for childless women yeah she's um, the landscape she is yeah. she's created the landscape actually I was yeah first to say yeah. it wasn't yeah. when she came along yes yeah you're right yeah um so yeah so obviously joji but i think but because i think well, all of the all of the people on all of the women on Plan B, on my Plan B, two thousand and seventeen, that you're all my role models. Yeah. Because you've all brought something to the table in some yeah. way. You've all you've all inspired me mm. in different ways and at different times. Yeah. Um. Yeah. 
So yeah, I'd say it will really put women on my plan B, on my long haul. And then famous celebrity-wise, Helen Mirren comes to mind. Yeah. Because she's so grounded, isn't she? Yeah. In her, yeah. In the way she is. And I really like that about her. And I'm just thinking, God, there's so many, isn't there? There's so many famous ones. Yeah, there are far more than you would imagine, actually. Yeah, yeah. And still, some of them stay hidden in plain sight, don't they? Yeah. And I mean, I'm still discovering people all the time. Yeah. And not necessarily famous people, but people's grandmothers, or people's, um, not grandmothers so much, actually, but people's kind of relatives and great aunts and people who live down the road. You know, yeah. Those kind of people. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, sometimes they're not the celebrities. Oh no. Not at all. Yeah. No. Yeah. And I think, you know, I am very inspired by all the women who come on Gateway Women Need Night Weekends because yeah. they do such a brave thing. Yeah, not easy. Just walking in that room, it really, you know, I see their, I see their faces on Saturday morning, and they're, they're really, often, mm. they're very frightened, and you can see they want to run for the hills. Yeah. And by Sunday night, they're just transformed. Yeah. They look, they look years younger. They, they look and feel and sound lighter, and they, they're actually role models to me yeah. that they because it it really it really gladdens my heart mm -hmm. because you can see that the work that gateway women does is so profound yeah it can lit is literally life changing yeah absolutely you know and I think some of the women say on the gateway uh women they might be friends and so it can be really inspiring uh, so yeah, there's a community of women around us, um, and they're everywhere. Mm. You know, these these are inspirational, childless women. Mm. Yeah, you know, there's far more, far more of us than maybe we thought. Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, when I started on this path, I thought I was actually the only one. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the funny thing is, is I had friends who were childless. I've got female friends who are childless, and we've never ever spoken about our childlessness to each other. Yeah. Isn't that remarkable? Yeah. No. We, we have now, but you know, I, I knew these women, I've known these women for years and years, and we've never had that conversation. I wonder what you would say now, looking mm. back to somebody you know, to other childless people, what's the one thing that you would say to them um, from where you are now that might advise them or encourage them or yeah, them or just the thing that you think people might need to know, that maybe the thing that you wish you'd known? I think the main thing is you're not alone yeah. and that you can't do this, you can't do your grief work on your own. Just yeah not possible no. we're not we're not built that way and that it's one of those things that when you dare to reach out yeah the healing is there for you yeah and it's and it's never as, it's never never as bad or as, or as painful as you think it's going to be it just it just isn't yeah and um and that you don't need to be alone. You just don't need to be. You know, there's a whole, like you say, there's loads of women out there. Yeah. Well, yeah. they speak for themselves, don't they? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. About how many women just in the UK yeah. who are, are, you know, we are, we're a bigger percentage than people think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Well, I think that that message that people don't need to be alone and that no. healing is out there and you, you know, that you need to do it with other people 
Mm. Just need to reach out is a fantastic place to finish. Mm. Um, so unless there's anything else that you'd like to say. No, thank, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, for, thank you for our conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Well, it's been wonderful to welcome you to the Childless Circle. Mm. And hopefully you'll be able to listen to some of the other people who are going to be interviewed. Um, who are all going to form links in this circle. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And I'd really like to thank you for coming along and joining the Childless Circle today, being part of it and sharing your story and your wisdom with everybody else. So thank you very much, Lauren. Oh, thank you, Mariel. <laughs> Take care. Take Bye, care. Lauren. Hello, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Robin Hadley to the Childless Circle today, and I'll ask him to introduce himself. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Robin Hadley. I'm uh, nearly 60. Whew. Where did those years go? And I'm uh, an involuntary childless man who is very broody in my mid-30s. And when I changed careers in my mid-40s, I trained as a counsellor and did a, a master's in counselling and part of the remit for that was you had to do something about yourself and I was very broody in my 30s so I studied that and that's when I found out there was really nothing about men and the desire for fatherhood and the impact of not becoming a father uh, and that was really interesting I, I interviewed 10 men and one of the, the big things about that was uh, they all sort of said there's something missing and that's really interesting that they, they can't grasp it. It's something undefined. Yeah. And uh, maybe later we'll say that undefinition, that not being having a resolution also goes from the personal, but to the political and the outside in, in all levels of society. Yeah. Um, and then I did an MSc where I looked at the levels of broodiness and um, found out really, the, the thing is that uh, generally people say women are broody and men aren't bothered and that they can be uh, fathers from puberty till death really. Mm -hmm. And that there's some big myths in there that need to be unpicked. But in my study, I found out that the levels were round about the same. And what was really interesting was the impact on the men's uh, feeling of isolation and depression and anger was quite high and in some most circumstances higher than anybody else's and so I think that may be well link into that there's something missing in that there's a reaction and it's inside but also outside yeah. but it's very hard to, to know what it is uh, because there's no social um, narratives around that Excuse me. And then I managed to get a PhD funded by Keele University, and that was looking at older childless men uh, and involuntary childless men. And I'm using the term involuntary to mean anybody who wanted to be a parent and didn't become them, because sometimes that, ter that term is quite often used in a clinical sense for people who've gone through infertility treatment or are going through infertility treatment and that, that's uh, applied when treatment's unsuccessful or people withdraw from treatment. Uh, but actually, a lot of research and a lot of the figures are based on those people in or who've um, registered in some way and are on the radar, so they're being counted. But there's a whole lot of people like me who wanted to be parents and didn't become them, mm -hmm. but never sought treatment for whatever reason. So they're not, they're not noted and therefore there's nothing around services for them. Yeah. And then I wrote some papers and I've been trying to bits and pieces of work. And um, yeah, so that's, that's me. That's where I'm at. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much for that brilliant introduction. And it's really very interesting to hear about your work. 
And I was very interested to read um, online what you found out that there isn't a narrative for men in the same way as there is for women, because women um, increasingly are more likely to talk about it and to talk about it both in their social circles and within their family, but also publicly. So I think it's really important that this the man's narrative is heard. And I was very heartened by the section at Fertility Fest about Men Matter Too, and hearing mm. men's voices was really inspiring. Um, so it's great that that's happening more often. I was also very interested that there was, that for men there seemed to be a greater negative effect in your research on being involuntarily childless than there is for women. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts about why that might be, or just to say a bit more about that. I, th I think it is uh, absolutely the lack of narrative to occupy yeah. uh, and I think we're all sort of raised to become an ideal person uh, as an individual but to fit in with society yeah. and often that's really portrayed in advertising um, but very few people hit those ideals yeah. and one of the, the like core ideals is to reproduce uh, and in that ideal is that men are validated through their, another word beginning with V that I can't quite remember yeah. now, <laughs> um, yeah. by reproducing outside themselves really. Yeah, by their ability so to do so and the visibility, the visibility of that. Yeah, and yeah. so that prov that provider role, going out being... Yeah. Uh, being the break and being fertility actually in all being fertile virile that's the word I was virile, studying, virile. yeah so uh, to be virile not only yeah. biologically but socially economically yeah. in all those sectors but all those sectors outside themselves yeah um, whereas for women uh, the, vir the virility is really determined by internally yeah uh, I when we go real down to it, uh, mm -hmm. it and it's different for different cultures. Yes. So in, in Western culture, there's a, a different virility uh, script coming in for women now about um, economic, finance, yeah. having a career, that sort of thing. Yes. But also, that's sort of challenged by that, uh, what somebody, Russo in 1974, I think, said, the, the motherhood mandate mm. that women are completely judged by whether they reproduce or not yeah. and that's I think it's true but it also in that motherhood mandate it it sort of fits in the narrative that men are always virile mm. biologically yeah. uh, but as we know in biology it changes over time and it's sort of convenient for society to say, well yeah it's okay for you because you're virile all the time yeah your, your, your sperm's always there and that's it. Yeah. Uh, but actually, when you look at it, <clears throat> there's more and more evidence that, yes, yeah, sperm's um, in production constantly from puberty till death, but yeah. it changes over time. Yeah. But also, that means sperm is more susceptible to environmental conditions. And there's more evidence coming out about yeah. that. So smoking, drinking, pollution, all that sort yeah. of thing. And quite often in research, you'll hear, oh, well, uh, mothers and babies are affected by pollution. So there's a big study came out uh, a few months ago about pollution in London. Yeah. But no mention of the men. Mm. And when it comes to reproduction, there's a sperm and an egg. So it, it takes both. Yeah. I, I'm no biologist, but I know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and it's really interesting that all that um, social sort of narrative is around mm. uh, the egg and it does all sorts of historical reasons for that. But maybe one of the most convenient things is that if men are judged by their virility outside themselves, mm -hmm. for a society, then you don't want your, your virile males to be seen as vulnerable. Yes. Yeah. So in a war situation, you'd be given a psychological advantage to your enemy mm -hmm. If you said, well, our men don't reproduce, they're not virile. There's yeah. this wrong with them, there's that wrong with them. Yeah. And 
I somehow think that's got built in to society. So um, why don't we know how many uh, childless men there are in the, in the UK or really in any, anywhere in the world apart from Norway? Um, it's because they don't collect the data at birth registration. Yeah. Whereas they do for women. So it's very accurate on how many childless women there are in the UK and around the world. Yeah. And a lot of the fertility policies are based around that figure. Yeah. But it's missing 50% of the population. Yeah. So uh, childlessness in the UK is about 20% roughly for women. Yeah. I'm saying that because it's 19.8 or something. I don't have yeah. that figure out my head, but 20%. Yeah. And around about and it's a lot more vague about men, around about 25% yes. for men. But we've got no uh, longitudinal data on that. It's usually one-off studies um, uh, for men that put that out. Uh, but in Norway, where they've been collecting data since the, the 70s, it, I think it's 25% for men and 19% for women or childlessness. Yeah. And there was a study from uh, Holland, from the Netherlands, that found out of the childless people, 80% were childless through circumstance, 10% childless through biology, mm. and 10% childless through um, choice. Yeah. So that childless by circumstance, which includes involuntary childlessness of all yeah. levels, apart from completely biological, mm. is quite a high proportion. Mm. And you know what I've done? I've gone off on a, a tangent here and I've forgotten what your question was. I'm sorry. Um, oh, I think it was about the narrative, the social the narrative, narrative for men. About, Why yeah. that isn't there. So yeah. for men, a, a lot of their partners say uh, he doesn't talk. Yeah. Um, I don't want him to resolve my problem. I just want to know what he's feeling. Uh, but he just clams up or he goes out or he does something that I feel means he's not listening to me. Uh, and I feel quite rejected by that. And I think for men, one of the, the metaphors they quite often use is, I am, I am the rock. That's my role. Yeah. I am a rock. Because everything's unstable. The situation's completely fluid. And what I can be is rock-like and unemotional. Um, and part of the reason for that is how men are socialized from a very young age to do things, to be object oriented, but also to deny their feelings. Yeah. So if, you, if you look at a man, you can just imagine a concrete plug going across his chest below his neck yeah and that's blocking off all the emotions and that's being placed there nobody chose that to happen yeah and it's being reinforced by things like uh, boys don't cry be a man man mm. up um those sort of things and those come very very early in life so on facebook i have uh, uh, friends who had babies and are toddlers and will say my little man mm. never seen my little woman yeah. applied to any uh child yeah really so i think and that's just indicative of how embedded that thing is in society yeah. so that's what you're dealing with when your man's not talking yes there's been years and decades of being reinforced socially not to talk yeah. and so when you ask a man how he's feeling and I know this from very personal right. I don't know I don't know what I'm feeling because yeah. that's been disconnected from me what am I supposed to feel and what uh, what your, your your male partner may say is I think I feel I think I feel and that's really really interesting because that's saying I'm thinking how I feel yes it's bypassing the plug yeah. And, and then what I'm going to do is going to make it safe for you by saying what you want to hear, but also make it safe for me. Yeah. Because although I'm a rock, I'm a volcano. Mm. And if I blow my top 
I'm just going to flood you and flood the situation and I'll be empty and shattered. Yeah. So to negotiate that is a really difficult yeah. thing for, for men and for their, for, and for their partners. Mm -hmm. But I think if you get that understanding that actually it's not him who's not saying anything, it's because he doesn't know what to say. He does want to be vulnerable. Yeah. Um, the woman who wrote um, The Handmaid's Tale, I think. Oh yeah, Margaret Atwood. Margaret Atwood said, women fear murder and men feel fear humiliation. Yeah. And I think there's something in that, apart from I think everybody fears being murdered. You can't just put that onto agenda. So we all um, feel being murdered, yeah, that's yeah. Not, <laughs> not something anybody yeah. wants to happen. Yeah. yeah. But I think the humiliation thing is, yeah. is really key yeah. because that's what happens again very early on. In, mm. And that's why men don't talk. When they do talk, it's very, very uh, intimate. So they will talk to their partner about mm. something that's happening, but they don't want to live in that moment for too long. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, once they say something, I'm feeling this. Uh, and that, uh, for me, when I was in practice, what I would say to the men is not what are you feeling, is what's happening inside. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because that's how embedded that concrete thing is. Uh, so there's a paper by Wong and Rotland that said men and women have absolutely the same emotional capital. Yeah. It's just how they're socialized differently to negotiate that and what to do with it. Yeah. And men are sort of socialized, like I said, to be object oriented and goal oriented. Mm -hmm. So actually um, doing things like art, uh, like poetry, like physical things, yeah. making a brick wall or something like that yeah. is a good way to do. Uh, now my uh, acquaintance, Glenn Poole, did a lot of work on uh, men who were suicidal. And what he found was the way of working was based on talking and talking from the inside out. Mm. And it didn't really work. Works well for, for women, but not for men. And what he found was actually working outside in was the better way. So mm. actually, a lot of men feel excluded through the uh, infertility process. Mm. There are partly because a lot if not all the treatment is on the women mm. so the uh, the partner builds up a relationship with the um, medical team and with the, the clinic and the men sort of feel isolated because they're just there for one thing yeah like a, a cash machine except a yeah. sperm machine yeah and not only that you go to a, a clinic and everybody knows what you're going to do there everybody knows you're going to go in that room mm -hmm. and masturbate mm -hmm. and that's a, a real pressure and then uh exit and be there and in some clinics the men are just the partner of the woman on the notes and stuff like that so they're not even uh appreciated as a a, a person yeah yeah so does this exclusion, like um, structural exclusion, yeah. institutional exclusion, that builds into actually men feeling uh, not fully functioning yeah. anyway? So when it comes to dealing with men, I think you've really got to take that whole thing. How did this man get here? And what was that route? Mm -hmm. And how can we put something in place that fits in with him? Yeah. And it could be very much related uh, i think drawing a parallel to whatever work he does or what his interests are yeah. so use that as a metaphor yeah okay so if this situation what you're feeling now was a, a work type mm. issue what would you do yeah and by taking it out like that so if it's i, I know electrician yeah. so well um the few the fuse board is blown and um okay so what would you do about that well i'd order a new one i'd do this so okay so how can we work with that metaphor for you yeah to do that and part of that might be 
actually just accepting that that few board is faulty and it can't be uh, replaced, but it can be worked round. Yeah. So there are other things yeah. to do. And uh, I think part of the childlessness thing is this disenfranchised grief. Mm. So this is a, a grief where there's no social narrative again, yeah. no things to do that are accepted around mm. it. And not only that, it's ongoing. And it comes back at different times and in different ways, yeah. particularly, I think, through media, because uh, they're trying to sell and they're generally trying to sell to the highest population, which at the moment is people with families. Um, but that is probably going to change. Yes. Yeah. So uh, men, can I just, men do talk in my research. Men talk forever. A mm. uh, long, long time, very, very intimately. Mm. What they, what they do fear is humiliation, and actually, that somebody understands. So, certainly, in my PhD, they all asked on the first contact, "Do you have children?" And mm. when I said no, ah, you'll understand then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I think uh, from some medical research of. Uh, help bulletins for medical things like cancer and stuff like that what they find is that there is a gender difference so women tend to hang around in those bulletin boards find a community something like that. the men tend to go in they like being anonymous mm -hmm. go in get the information they want and then move away from it mm -hmm. so things like gateway women yeah is really uh good and fits in with that criteria i know yeah. jody says men ask about it but you know it's for women but i think if there was an equivalent for gateway women gateway men then there'd be a higher churn yeah of people coming in getting the information and then going off and then maybe coming back once or twice and there'll be a few core so i think that and again that's down to the socialization yeah yeah it's not so much that they don't want or need those support networks they're just not conditioned to use them in the same way that women do yeah and and once you appreciate i don't know this is how men operate or some men operate yeah. uh because we're talking very broad brush strokes there's yeah. always some that operate differently the same with women yeah um then then you can start to work with that that actually it's not him no as a person he's not trying to be difficult <clears throat> yeah. but what he's got to work with is that something different yeah. and that's that going across that that concrete plug yeah and how difficult it is to work yeah. through that concrete plug when that's all you've ever known and you've been taught from very very young age from like a toddler that that's how you have to be in the world to be a man yeah 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 absolutely and i think if you're in that situation then maybe uh, a good thing is to actually put a time limit on it mm. in a way so i just Okay, so what's happening inside? What do you think we can do about it? Right, we're just going to discuss that bit. Yeah, yeah. And we're just going to do it for ten minutes or fifteen minutes, yeah. and then, then you're released. And then we'll do something else, you know. And then, then we'll, we'll do something else, something positive. Yeah. yeah we'll go off and yeah. we'll go for a walk, or we'll, yeah, yeah, do something or make something. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, and I think also uh, men are also brought to be problem resolvers. You know, yeah. that thing about mansplaining, which is dubious to say the least but actually it's men trying to help yeah yeah this is what and i'm socialized to do to yeah all things i'm going to try and resolve it to the best of my ability and the, the the poignancy in trying to to be held in that position of wanting to resolve something that can't be resolved yeah yeah Let's and see. particularly i think <clears throat> when uh, the science doesn't work yeah yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's science has, you know, kind of let, has let people down, actually. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder what it's like um, for you to work in a field where you are also personally affected by the area within which you are working. So I am childless, not by choice, and I work as a counsellor predominantly for other childless people. Um, and I wonder what it's like for you, there's a parallel there. I know you're no longer working as a counsellor, 
but you're still researching within this area. And I wonder, how is that for you to work within a field that affects you personally? When, um, when I was doing my research, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I felt very responsible for my participants that mm -hmm. they um, revealed themselves to me. Yeah. And I, I thought this really needs to go out there and the, there needs to be some input into the social narrative so it changes. Yeah. And that, since they've shown faith in me and I've got the, the knowledge to study as well, then I, I can do that. And actually my own experience is a vehicle for everyone else. And particularly in the media, they want the personal rather than yeah. the political. Yeah. So, so I, I, I step up and say, well, that's my experience. And it's these men's experience as well. Yeah. And this is where, where men are missing. So for me to work in this area, I, you know, I'm really privileged that those men told me their stories. Yeah. Uh, which some are, bits of it are the same as mine, others are, are different. And so, I, you know, men are, men are just fascinating. They're fascinating because of that struggle of trying to be themselves, but in such uh, a box of narratives that's sort of limited. Yeah. Uh, they're trying to negotiate around that and be everything. So that, that's sort of fascinating for me. I have a lot of empathy now for men that I probably didn't. And I'd, I'd say that's true. If we're in a misogynistic society or patriarchal society, yeah. it's misogynistic, but it's also misandraic as well. Yeah. It hates women and it hates men. Yeah. Uh, mainly. So, mm. um, so for me to work in this field, it's a privilege and it is emotionally it can be really emotionally draining. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I, when I was brought up, I was quite shy. Um, I come from a big family at the younger end. And so there's uh, a lot of uh, sibling stuff going on there, dynamics. Yes. Okay. Um, and I was really shy. How I ever formed a relationship is amazing, really. <laughs> Never mind a few. Um, and I'm still shy now and a bit reticent socially. But the reason I do this is because I can compartmentalize myself. This isn't about me. This is about me delivering a message. Yeah. Okay, so I sort of suspend myself, I suppose, in a grand way. I could say, for the greater good. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Not for that, but I know there's something about finding out there's nothing about men, mm. and that I, I thought there needed to be yeah. that needed to be there. Absolutely. That that gives me the um, the petrol to the engine, I yeah. guess. The yeah. fuel, I guess. Fuel, yeah. Uh, there is that. Yeah. To keep to keep to keep you going. Yeah. Yeah. And one of one of the parts of the recent research that I did with John. Barry from University College London and Chloe Newby from the Male Psychology Network was on um, looking at uh, childlessness in later life. Mm. And we did uh, an online survey through a marketing company because we couldn't get the numbers. So we, mm. we, we paid, actually, my, my brother Tony uh, died and part of his legacy money went on that project. So we paid for that. So I uh, just want to recognize my brother Tony in that. And he was a childless man yeah, uh, as well. So an older childless man who died of cancer in his mid fifties. So he fits the stat. Yeah. Um, and so we did this research and we got 300 odd replies. And one of the things we found was that actually how you're brought up, your attachment, Mm. influenced how if you became if you were childless and mm. it sort of fits very obviously people will go oh that's obvious but sometimes mm. the obvious things need to be explored Absolutely. like uh and it, so if you're shy or mm. not quite sure in relationships because that's the way you were brought up that mm. goes throughout your life yeah. So for me, certainly my late teenage years, when all my mates were um, finding partners very easily and going out, I'd find that really difficult to ask somebody out. 
yeah and uh wanna and that was down to to that and yeah. put and underneath that was that fear of humiliation yeah and that fear of rejection so you can see how that gets built in and yes. um, there's a sort of assumption that just because you age and get experience through age that actually you'll work your way through that yeah you may get different strategies you can put in place but underneath is the default position still going to be you know this is a a situation where i might get humiliated by um and so i think that that did impact um my life course yeah. the arc of life and also my timing of relationships and timing of relationships and how you form relationships and who you form relationships with and economics are all factors in uh childlessness it's not just uh biological yeah. there's biological there's social there's psychological and there's economic all these things combine and for me, sorry, I'll let you get a word in edgeways. Oh, don't worry. No, it's fascinating. One of the things about uh, student loans mm. is the impact that's going to have on people's reproductive choice. Yeah. Because I think it's going to delay and it's, there's already delays happening already. Yeah. So everything is connected. It's not just... Everything. It's not just one simple answer. No, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And society, societal factors and personal factors are really coming together by the sound of it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. 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 When you were going through, and you know, as you say, this, these, these childless journeys don't end, they just change. Um, so going through your journey, is there anything that either particularly helped you or particularly hindered you to kind of heal or resolve from the experience of being childless, not by choice? Oh, okay. I'm just going to go back to what I was saying about uh, shyness. In my mid-30s, when I was really, really broody, yeah. I think that really kicked in mm. because I'd go out basically looking for a partner mm. but not have the social skills and certainly had the, the worry mm. about being rejected. Yeah. And then the, the thought is, well, what if I get rejected? Well, I won't do it. And then that becomes a self-fulfilling prof prophecy yeah. in a way. It's safe but it's lonely. Um, okay, so your question was what? I'm sorry. What, what, what either hindered or helped you in sort of making your way through this, navigating this journey as a man okay. without children? Um, probably it, it was not having children hindered and helped. Yeah. Because um, the absence sort of drove me so that was a help yeah. and know it and that's it one of the underlying things for my ma was was it just me yeah and for my ma msc was it just me so being able to find out actually it's not just me yeah was really good so that's a help yeah definitely uh it's, it's i don't know what hindered me i think it did hinder me i think it hindered me when it comes particularly at work when people were having conversations, I remember once I was having a brew and there was a, a man and a woman there and they were talking about their kids and DS and the kids were doing DS. And all I could think of was drug squad. And these kids were seven or something like that. I think, you know, what, your kids are playing drug squad. Yeah. And they, they sort of laughed at me, went, no, no, DS, Nintendo DS, the, the games. And it's only later when I was doing my research, I saw the significance of that tiny tiny piece of uh everyday interaction actually i don't know what's happening mm. i am separate from that but also how they mocked me for not knowing mm. and there was like a hierarchy then yeah you know you're not in this club we've got our codes yeah but i think that's another thing that uh childless people uh voluntary or involuntary uh face yeah there's whole things around there and uh, children are bridges socially. Yes. Yeah. But also there's some gatekeepers and tolls on those bridge. And there's a great song by uh, Paul Simon called wristband. Okay, and uh, 
yeah. uh, it's uh, superb because if you don't get if you don't have a wristband you don't get in uh, yeah and he's talking about socially and economically in the cities in the states and stuff like that and particularly about um uh, race yeah but it actually goes for reproduction as well yeah absolutely and i think i you know i've experienced othering both as a gay woman but i've also experienced more othering as a childless woman actually yeah. and there's i i feel that that's more difficult for me being yeah. childless and that's something i have to come out about more than i do about being gay yeah that's 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 much more of a sense i'm much more of a sense of exclusion because of that yeah um, that thing about not 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 having that bridge not having that wristband yeah so yeah it's, it's harder for me which is is a good thing about our society i think is that we are more um you know we oh. are much more accepting of diversity in some of the obvious ways like there's far mm. less homophobia um although our trans brothers and sisters aren't having a great time but yeah i think childlessness is is an area of diversity that really has not been addressed and mm. it's still okay to exclude childless people and so yeah. people don't have the wristband so yeah <laughs> yeah and that uh it, it cuts across all genders yeah it so, cuts across all classes it cuts yeah. across everything yeah. and uh yeah and i guess that would then lead into how people say well why don't you just oh yeah yeah why don't you just then have idea because it's open to you now yeah. uh why don't you just adopt yeah for yeah. men well you know you can re uh, reproduce any time during your life it's not a problem yeah Absolutely. But it is a problem. Socially, there is a social clock about generally when it's uh, okay to have a child. Yeah. And uh, if you're not Rod Stewart or one of the money yeah. delete, yeah. then it's different. Mm. And for yeah. most people, if you're an older person who has a child, then you're a bit of an oddity. Yeah. Uh, and when it comes to uh, sperm again, mm. you know, Donations, sperm donators, there's an age limit. It's usually 35 or 40. Yeah. And they wouldn't have that there if men were 100% fertile from puberty to death. Mm -hmm. And there was something else I was going to say, but it's gone from my mind. So I'll leave it there. If looking, looking back on your experience, um, is there anything that you would want to say based on what you know now, to a childless, not by choice man who was perhaps somewhat earlier in their journey? Is there any word of advice or word of support that you could give them? Just because there's no voices and there's no narrative to occupy doesn't mean to say you're alone. Yeah. Uh, you're not alone. Yeah. That's a really powerful message, actually. Mm. You're not alone. Don't be fooled into thinking that you are because there's no narrative. Yeah. Yeah. And have there been any, because I'm beginning to get a sense that you are a role model um, called Men Without Children. Have you had, have you had any um, male role models, male childless role models that you've been able to look to for support? Uh, oh gosh, that's a good question. That's, that's a first, absolute first. <laughs> Male role models. Not particularly. Uh, I guess that my, not male role models. No. I, I really appreciate my uh, supervisor at my MA for saying, yes, go on, do that. Yeah. And oh, actually, one guy, when I was working, a guy called Professor Philip Pragnall. Mm. Uh, I worked with him. As I was a technician. I was nothing. No. And and he said, oh, you know, Rob, I think you have uh, the capacity to do a PhD. And just somebody actually saying, I think you can do it, mm. actually sowed a seed. Yeah. Um, I think just somebody sowing a seed can be as good as a role model and actually somebody else showing belief in you. Sorry, I'm tearing up here. Yeah. Um, um, so I shouldn't be sorry about that. It's an emotional thing. Exactly. Shouldn't be. No, it's, yeah, um, because, you're, it's, because it's important. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so somebody showing uh, belief in you when you, yeah. but you don't believe yourself. Yeah. 
And it sounds as if the experience of childlessness, certainly for me, and I think lots of other people as well, can lead you to not believe in yourself. Yeah. I think so to have somebody who shows you or who says to you, I've got faith that you can do this. Yeah. You know, is actually a really important thing. And I guess that's something that we can all do for our child yeah. brothers and sisters is to say, yes, this experience has been deeply disempowering. Um, yeah. But there's, there's, there are things that you can do. But I, I guess going back to validity and validity, yeah. um, then you, you are valid. Yeah, absolutely. And you're not defined by this one thing, although it may seem absolutely all encompassing and all around you yeah yeah but there is more to you hmm. than being a parent there's more, yeah there's more to men than being a father and a provider yeah. there is more yeah. yeah absolutely i think that sounds like quite a good place to finish mm -hmm. unless there's anything else that you'd like to say at all about anything that we've talked about in this interview um I, I just I go I come back to something missing and I think that the men that uh, they all said there's something missing that mm -hmm. it's just I think so powerful that it is missing from the inside but also the outside I think yeah. if you acknowledge that well actually that's not black it's blank yeah so yeah. you can choose how you how you fill the missing yeah. Yeah. and probably it'll never be fully full no and that little bit will be a bit organic and come out and yeah. cover everything, but then it'll go back down. Yeah. Yeah. So there is the possibility of not entirely filling the space because yeah. it is unfillable. Yeah. But the other things will be possible. Yeah. Yeah. Even though we may not get the things that we dreamed of, but other things will happen. Yeah. I just like to say a very big thank you to you, Dr. Robin Hadley, for coming and speaking to me today. And it's been wonderful to hear both your personal and your professional journey. And I think that some of the things you've said today are very important and given me a lot of things to think about. So yeah, I just want to say a very big thank you for you for coming and being part of the Childless Circle. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Again. And hopefully our paths will cross again in some other way. I look forward to that. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.